Hi everybody who I met at the Childhood Trauma Conference in Melbourne. Thank you those who sent me a message asking for a copy of my slides. I've attached them right here. And even if you couldn't make it and ask for a copy, um, I've recorded them with some audio so the slides make sense for you. So I spoke about the transformative model of therapeutic change. Let's get into it. So first I thought I'd ask you, do you have a model? So how do you explain to other people how change occurs? Obviously clients come and see you at the beginning of the course of therapy, or maybe you're a teacher or a youth worker or um, a family therapist. However you work, you kind of need to have some way of being able to explain to others about how change happens. So I'm really curious, do you have a model? Uh, if you do, um, what's the process that it involves? And um, so who is it that has informed your work? Yeah, And what is it that you have chose to include in your work? So for me, I really just needed to get down to like, what are the not negotiables, the things that I, I can't um, not put down? So anyway, maybe just uh, have a breath and a moment to kind of think about how would I explain it to my colleagues, uh, to my clients, the people that I work with, how change happens. Needed a way to be able to put it into a coherent model. So anyway, it just was useful for me to be able to see there's a number of overlapping and interconnecting parts and concepts. It helped me to have this really integrated, consolidated view of how I work. So I'm going to share it with you now. There's kind of two parts to it. One is that there's some outside building block walls, which are the foundation theories that I never put down. And then there's this spiral of therapeutic change that happens in the middle, which is kind of the, the journey of you and the client together. So we'll start over here. I'll just move the arrow with here, attachment development and memory systems. Um, attachment is obviously important. We're born into a relational context. We need that in order to be able to survive and to grow and to develop. And our primary drive as human beings is to belong. So it's kind of the conditions in which we are able to grow. Yeah, And all of those experiences that we encounter in that relational field get stored in our memory systems. So how to work with memory, we're basically a giant bag of nerve cells. You know, each nerve cell doesn't actually touch each other. They interact chemically and electrically. All of that information gets stored in our memory systems. You know? And then how we chemically and electrically interact with other big bags of nerve cells, other humans, also gets laid down in our memory systems. So how we regulate closeness and distance in relationships, how we regulate our arousal, all of those things, how we cue to get our needs met, which needs are okay to show, which ones aren't, all get slowed down in our memory systems. And depending on your attachment strategies, these get encoded differently in the different memory systems. So that takes us to our next building block here, foundation theory. And it's when we raise awareness about what's happening between us and our clients or what's happening between them and their peers or them and their parents or them and their siblings, people start to get emotionally dysregulated yeah, because we're going in touchy area. So it raises people's ego defenses, which is if they're not able to cue directly to get their needs met, they've had to find some other way to be able to hold themselves together, yeah, how to regulate their emotions. And this is their ego defenses. So we need to, when those emotions and those memories come up, we need to be able to find a way to be able to reprocess that arousal and those memories and to lay down new biological pathways in the brain. So then that takes us to the third building block theories over here, this green wall, systemic context, you know, of either us and the client or us and the family, but there's a number of subsystems that are all interacting and then how that gets generalized to the outside world. And what we're looking for is that in those systemic contexts, we want to reprogram so there can be emotionally corrective experiences. Yeah, and when we do that, we make our way down here, whoops, to the fourth building block theory down the bottom, which is that we start to see ourselves part of a larger narrative. Yeah, and we start to think about, well, why did this happen to me? What has it got to do with why I'm here? And when the trauma gets transformed to something that's kind of a positive and life affirming and engaging with greater life, it starts to connect with our spirit, yeah, which is kind of like why we're here and start to ask these bigger, bigger questions. So anyway, they're the outside building block theories. And then in the center, what happens is that we can't really apply any of those theories unless we go through this, this process, this circular process. 
So we start down here with client-centered relational holding. So this is Rogerian, Carl Rogers, and the client comes to us and we start to have, you know, we join with them, there's a therapeutic alliance. This becomes the ground for um, growth to be able to occur. So they have, the client has some experience of scaffolded trust with us, and when they ha experience that, then this narrative emerges, yeah, which is the second box here. And so the narrative is the story, yeah, and it can be the story of what brought them to see you, it can be what happened to them last night, it could be their trauma history, it could be their a, a genogram, it could be the history of their presenting problems. So initially I used to get these big long narratives or behavioral sequences of what's happened, and now what I'm interested in is basically what is the narrative that is co-created between myself and the client. So in the interactions that we have, their memories, their affect and their arousal all gets played out right in front of me and I get to feel that, experience that and, and it becomes a co-created interactive field where we're working to resolve past trauma and to raise awareness and to have some um, receive emotionally corrective experiences. So this is when the client encounters some resistance. Yeah, because as soon as they have their needs met, it instantly transports them back to all the painful memories of when they didn't have their needs met, yeah, or how they were disconnected from their resources. So we need to have some way to be able to connect them with relational and somatic resources so we can kind of stabilize their nervous system. And this is so they can do the work, yeah, so they can actually release whatever the emotions and process whatever emotions that they need to. We can bring the neocortex back online and start to uh, improve their reflective functioning and also raise their awareness of what it is that they're experiencing in their body to be able to lay down new memories. So when we do that, it takes us here, that there needs to be this ongoing kind of systemic holding and we increase coherency, you know, the connections between them and the others, significant others, and also the connection between the parts of themselves, their past, their present, and their future, you know, their heart and their brain, um, all of their nervous system. And so we also need to look at the timing of the trauma because it's not enough for us just to do the work in a counseling or therapeutic setting. The client also needs some kind of brain enrichment to be able to go back and to heal the parts of their brain that have been affected by trauma. So when we do that, we get here to this fifth block which is that there starts to be some shifts in the person's internal working model, how they see themselves, their world, and their future. We're laying down new memories. And what happens here is that they start to improvise, yeah, experiment with changes in their life. So it's a bit more a cognitive behavioral thing, but they become more in tune with what are their values, who they are as a person, what they stand for, what's important to them. And there's this connection with um, an invitation to greater life for them and crossing thresholds. And this kind of brings us into the area more of spirituality, where transformation takes place. So the part in this kind of spiral of therapeutic change in the middle link to the outside building block theories. So I'm just going to take you a little bit through the not negotiable the attachment and memory. Um, I've been heavily influenced by DMM. Now, I know you don't like acronyms, and I could have put another five slides in, so you're welcome to look up DMM, Google it. It's the Dynamic Maturational Model. This is Pat Crittenden's work. She's another attachment guru. She wasn't at the conference that we went to, but uh, if you ever get the chance to see her, you might have to go to England or America. It's well worth going. So her contributions to attachment are to do with information processing. From birth, start to either have a secure strategy or an ambivalent or an avoidant strategy. And if you look up the dynamic maturational model looks like, it's kind of like a big pie with lots of pieces of the pie to it. And if you go down one side, it's the ambivalent side. If you go down the other side, it's the avoidant side. So, and as you make your way down each piece of pie to the bottom of the, the pie, yeah, this is where there's the most pathology and up the top is where it's kind of the most secure. But she, her important contribution is that attachment is a theory about information processing. So depending on our attachment style, we will each receive and uh, store and encode and retrieve memories in different ways. So if you an, have an avoidance strategy or a dismissive state of mind, yeah, you're more likely to um, 
to distance yourself when somebody asks you questions and you're more likely to shut to shut the person down so when they try and probe you or get some description you don't really allow them to go there or well, the person doesn't allow you to go there yeah and um, they then kind of move into a bit of a, like a role reversal situation where they're really attuned to who holds power and they borrow the person's language and um, the, the main thing that's important for them is that they inhibit negative affect. Yeah, and so they have learnt consistently by having their negative behavior and affect punished by their parents that they don't show it. So they kind of have this false affect where they can kind of smile when really they're, they might be quite dysregulated or they might be quite sad. So this is quite quite important, and they really disconnect from their their memories and their internal sensations. So they could be, have quite a lot of pain, and they really even just disconnect from that. So the information processing can either be affected by um, slight distortions, or there can be omissions, or then there can be gross transformations. You know, where um, the person kind of becomes a bit delusional. You know, they might have a really idealized view of their parents when when in fact when they were sick or when they were frightened their parents weren't even really there for them yeah and with ambivalent attachment uh, again how they process information and um, how they sort it in the memory system quite different so you know these people with ambivalent strategies they're either really good at disarming you by kind of acting coy vulnerable shy um, like they're incompetent or they need rescuing and evocative language and images when they're describing things to you so they really kind of draw you in yeah and it's like they want to they want you to have an alliance with them and to share their mind so it's a very different process they have these alternating strategies where if they're not disarming you yeah then they're either becoming a bit more kind of threatening or aggressive and it feels like you're walking on eggshells and it's because they're trying to control you and, that, and through fear um, they'll get you to comply with meeting their needs is that the function of the behavior is really important so with people that are avoidant the function of their behavior has been really adaptive it's been a creative adjustment for them so what they do is that they um, act like they need independence or autonomy when they really need comfort or closeness or intimacy or someone to organize their feelings and there's a reason they do that yeah, the reason they do it is because it has been protective for them they don't want a cue to get those needs met because it could press the buttons of their parent and so they know that if they actually inhibit their needs it means that they're not going to be treated with punishment or alienation or indifference and they really kind of make themselves invisible yeah, so that they're not a burden to their caregivers. And then later on, yeah, they will kind of develop an anxiety disorder, probably. Uh, but um, at the time, it's quite an adaptive thing for them to do. Yeah, and then also with people that have an ambivalent strategy, yeah, the function of their behavior is really important as well because they use these disarming strategies and these kind of controlling and coercive, you know, exaggerating negative emotions because it attracts someone in a caregiving capacity and it also keeps them engaged with them so it's a really functional thing that they've learned to do and so they act like there's a threat or that there's something to be fearful of when in fact there's no threat yeah they kind of exaggerate their their emotions and they're more connected with their sensations in their body but in a way that it's over over stimulating for them and can be dysregulating so Pat Crittenden, if you don't know much about her, um, definitely look her up. The other important contribution from attachment is cause here, the circle of security. So again, this is something that you can Google. I would have had to put in another 20 slides. But the circle of security, this is the work of Kent Hoffman, Bert Powell, Glenn Cooper, and others. And they have these, this thing which is really central to the circle of security. It's a, a graphic probably the simplest graphic that you'll ever find for understanding how attachment works but it's this bigger stronger wise and kind this here bigger stronger wise and kind so often there can be a, a split here between bigger and stronger so these are the, the qualities that you're looking for in a partner someone who can be a secure base for you uh, they're the qualities that you look for in a parent if you're a child that you need to have a, a secure uh, attachment strategy 
and they're also the strategies that you would look for probably in an employer or a team leader um, if you want to have a healthy workplace. But often we get this, I was saying that there can be a split, yeah, where you can either experience just bigger, stronger, which is like mean and frightening, or only wise and kind, yeah, which is experienced as weak and frightened. And sometimes you see this split in organizations that the director and the manager is one or the other. So anyhow, um, really important contribution. Without this model, I probably wouldn't have learned about how we cue and miscue our needs. Yeah. So we act like we have, have one need when in fact it, um, it's just a strategy that we've laid down that was adaptive for us. And it's not helpful in the long run for us. And we have an opportunity every subsequent developmental stage to rework the strategy. Um, but it gets laid down at a time that's very early in life for us, yeah, uh, in the first few years uh, when we're born uh, through toddlerhood. And so these... Um, you know, how we cue to get our needs met get laid down in procedural memories that are implicit. Yeah, we're not even aware that we're doing it, we're on autopilot. And it's helpful for parents to know that um, this strategy isn't something that they've um, done on purpose to harm their child, but in fact it's just been downloaded to them from their experiences of being parented when they were children. Yeah, this right brain downloading comes from Alan Shaw. You know, he's worked on um, affect regulation and dysregulation and he was at the conference if you had a chance to see him he gave a talk on creativity and I'll get to that a, a little bit later but right brain downloading another really important concept that um, comes from him that's not negotiable so I'm curious about what holds me um, when I'm doing work with clients you know what I'm actually attached to how I can get out of the way so I can have that connection to a much bigger field um, and can create the conditions in that field for the client's growth. Brings me in touch with the origins of the client's trauma. So Alan Sruf's, Sruf's work, S-R-O-U-F-E, he looked at transgenerational patterns of attachment strategies and he could see at 24 months of age, the strategy that was used by a child with their parent when that child grows up in the next generation, that these patterns are really stable. So we need to go back to how we um, give and receive love and how those patterns were changed as a result of trauma or grief and loss. We need to somehow find a way to be able to go back in time yeah, to see where that was interrupted, where that flow of love was interrupted. So this is the Iram, the interrupted reaching out movements yeah, in the client. So they've inherited them. It's kind of like vertical transmission. So the way that I get to that is through this work, family and systemic constellation work. Yeah, And really uh, what I've discovered over the last few years is that I'm working with um, the flow of love through the generations and where it has been interrupted. So the theory here that's been helpful is from Bert Hellinger, his orders of love, you know, that the big one always gives to the small one that um, whoever comes first, comes first. So in a, a time where we have lots of single parent families or blended families or adopted families or foster children that we're working with, these orders of love get, in, get interrupted um, and entangled really easily because often the child has hidden loyalties yeah, to their foster parent or to the step parent. And if we don't look at whoever comes first, yeah, then it can lead to interpsychic conflicts and symptoms in the child. So he also has other orders of love. Uh, some examples of them are the um, balance between giving and receiving, and that everyone is included. You know, if we exclude someone because of something that they've done wrong in a previous generation, then somehow in the next generation. Um, a child there out of loyalty and to maintain the homeostasis of the family system will take on the symptoms. Yeah? So they might end up with an addiction or some kind of illness that keeps a connection to the part of the system where someone has been excluded. So the Orders of Love, Bert Hellinger, again, look him up, really important. Uh, Stephen Porges uh, was at the conference with us. So his ideas about the love code you know that first you have to have safety. Once you have safety, then you can have proximity, which is you know closeness, 
When you've got proximity, then you can start to have some intimacy, and when you have intimacy, you can start to bond, and when you bond, then the flow of love can be restored. Yeah, But of course, the population that we work with, where there's been trauma, people have tried to experience love where there hasn't been safety. So if we go back to Hellinger's term, it, there's an entanglement. Yeah, And then we look at people's love languages. So more and more I'm realizing that when we're working with trauma, really what we're in service of is of love. So um, I made a comment in the talk at the conference that the next time somebody asks you, um, you know, who you work for or what you do, um, you can say to them that you're in service of love. Yeah. So anyway, just to um, uh, really feel your feet on the floor, have a breath, to breathe that in, you know, imagine that that's your response, and then notice what happens in your body. You know, do you feel a bit more taller, a bit more open, you know, like there's a bit more nobility in the work that you do? Yeah, it's good for you to, to actually to feel that. So, if we move up to the second block, working with neurobiology and emotionally re reprocessing, we have to have some way of being able to work with arousal. Yeah? So, first of all, we have to be able to regulate our own arousal so that we can do co-regulation between us and the client. So this is self-regulation and co-regulation up here. Yeah, and when we do that, we're kind of matching and mirroring what's happening with the other client. They see themselves in our face and in our experience, the message they get from our face. But at the same time, what's happening is that we're scanning yeah, our own interior experiences, what the information is that's coming through our own sensations. Yeah, this term called interoception, again, from Alan Shaw. Yeah, and so the client might be sitting in front of us and they might be quite smiley and saying, oh yeah, I really am responsible for my own happiness and I exercise and I work hard, I'm a single parent with three children. And at, at the same time that you're looking at them, you notice that in your own chest, yeah, that you have this deep sense of heaviness, yeah, like there's sadness or there's pain or something that is just not matching up and not congruent with what is happening with the client. So this is a really important capacity yeah, of a teacher, a therapist, for all human beings really, is to be able to use our interoception. Yeah, and when I voice that, you know, and I can I can say even though you're you're smiling and you're talking really fast, um, it's not matching up with my experience. Yeah, and it you know could belong to me, but I'm just thought I would share it with you. And then the client goes, Oh, that, yeah, I've had that my whole life that this is the pain or the grief that I've been carrying that nobody sees. Yeah. And so when they voice that, it's important to be able to process, you know, what is that like for you to be able to voice that, to be able to connect with it. And then they start coughing or they um, start feeling some anxiety across the top of their chest. Yeah. And that you can actually follow this process and what has been hidden can now be seen. Yeah. And in doing that, you're starting to work with the person's arousal. Yeah. And and you've kind of gives you the capacity to be able to see through their defenses. So you need to have some way of being able to work with arousal, you know, whether it's in this way, a relational way, um, or whether it's working with the body. Um, you need to have some way of being able to work with arousal. So anyway, um, there's lots of people that have written about this, you know, whether it's Bruce Perry, you know, his, um, you know, the zone of proximal development, whether it's Pat Ogden, it's the window of tolerance whether it's Pat, Pat Crittenden's work that I mentioned previously, Peter Levine's work, you know, his um, uh, model of stress, uh, Winnie Dunn, Jean Ayres, Tina Champagne, there's a whole heap of other people that I, you could look up. So I'm not sure who informs your work with working with arousal, but you need to find someone to be able to include it. Um, the most recent one that I've been working with over the last uh, three years is Gabrielle Roth's work. And this is an embodied movement meditation. So I'll share a little bit about that with you now. But basically, um, if we look at this as the window of tolerance or the zone of proximal development, whoever's theory you want to go with, yeah, that the client will either come with hyperarousal up here or um, hypoarousal down here. But this is an embodied practice. So it's kind of like you work with clients to build them up to this where I get them to paint with their eyes closed and get them to imagine that paint brushes their body and that it's moving on the page as if it would if you were a dancer on a dance floor. 
and to work with their arousal in quite a safe way first before taking them to a hall where there's, there is a, a, a wooden dance floor and they have the, the opportunity to do some meditation, to tune into their internal experience and to be able to follow whatever the impulse is that comes through their body. Yeah, and um, so in this model, you get to be taken through two waves of arousal. So this is kind of what the wave looks like, this blue line here. And the first one probably goes for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then the second one goes for a bit longer. So in a two hour period, you have like a mini wave and then a much larger wave. And the first kind of rhythm of arousal um, that we is called flowing, yeah? And these are linked to different elements. They're also linked to different emotions. They can be linked to different stages of development. Uh, you can probably look up Gabrielle Roth's work. Um, she's uh, passed away now, but uh, she's published a few books. So uh, flowing is these circular movements, yeah? With your arms, with your body, with your head. When we are in a place of fear because it's to do with being seen when we are on a dance floor. And it brings back all our automatic um, procedural memories of what's okay to how to move and what's not okay and what's safe and what isn't. The emphasis is on the feet, yeah? And just following your feet, connecting with the floor, the earth, and being grounded, yeah? Because we're working with our fear. This is a, quite a feminine energy. So the circular movements are to do with receiving. It's what you need to take in or to receive in order to be able to work with your fear or to let go of your fear and to become more grounded. And when we do that, um, we move into this next rhythm here, which is staccato. And this is a really strong um, beat, yeah? Uh, so you can move to this beat. And in the talk that I gave at the conference, I got some of the audience to clap and some of the audience um, with keeping a beat and the rest of them to move, to follow whatever the impulse is that's in their body and to really to find their shapes of their body, to find their direction, their intention, to find their edges. So this is much more of a male shape and it has to do with fire. It's um, often these are outward kind of movements that you make with your limbs and it's for being able to release anger. So that's staccato. And then we move from staccato, we kind of have a combination of both of these flowing in staccato and we move into chaos, which is really fast fast music is high arousal like water you know it just goes uh, whatever the direction of the landscape is it's with being really fluid in your body rhythm of chaos you know a lot of people with trauma experience this all the time they have too much chaos actually and they need to be able to either come back to flowing or to staccato or to stillness or to some other rhythm because when you have too much chaos in your life um, you know, you would have heard, for those who went to Pat Ogden's talk, she had this client that she filmed, that she showed, who said, I get raped repeatedly and I don't really care if they hurt me, I just want them to kill me when it's over. So this is a person who just said, I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah, the, the problem with too much chaos in your life is that you get really exhausted and run down. So we get to experience chaos on this flow in a really safe, controlled way, yeah? It's a rhythm that we build up to and it's a rhythm that we learn to modulate arousal with coming down from. It's not something that you're stuck in, which is what happens with trauma. In trauma, you either have too high arousal or too low arousal, yeah? And too low arousal is that you're depressed. Too high arousal is that you're living, re-experiencing trauma and you're stressed, you're anxious, you're chaotic, fragmented. We want to have a safe experience of high arousal because high arousal can be positive. Yeah, it can be joy, it can be elation, it can be letting go. And this rhythm here is about letting go. It's kind of like um, you're moving so fast that you're shaking off everything. It's like nothing can stick to you anymore. You're letting go of everything that doesn't belong. And when we do that, we feel really light. And we move down into this next rhythm here, which is lyrical. And it's associated with air and joy, and it's quite freeing and liberating. And this movement here is really light on your feet, and it's quite whimsical and playful. So we move from that rhythm there down into stillness, yeah, which is having compassion for self, for others, and allowing your body to find its movements within stillness. Yeah, very slow, precise, 
um, measured conscious movements. Yeah, and it's a little bit like if you're watching someone do Tai Chi. This is a way that we can allow people to be able to have an embodied experience that is safe of being able to modulate their arousal with being able to have work up to having high arousal and to being able to come down into low arousal. It's important that it's facilitated, that somebody holds the space and that the floor is kind of a container the same way that you would have a sand tray that is a container for, for doing sand tray and symbol work or that you hold the space you know, if you're doing emotional release work with a client in the, in the therapeutic setting. In working with neurobiology and, and reprocessing emotions and sensations, we can have either proximal or distal approaches. Uh, we start to look at what's sensory and what's relational. So I'm going to show a few little examples of some proximal work. And this comes from Cornelia Elbrecht and Liz Antcliff, um, who I was very fortunate to be able to study initiatic arts with practice of guided drawing. And that there's a, continu a continuum with even looking at the, the different mediums that you use, you know, from whether it's, um, you know, chalk or charcoals or pencils, you know, all the way down to the other end of the continuum where you're starting to work with crayons or pastels or paints or even clay. Again, this would be another whole talk. It's like a two-year course. Yeah, it's a proximal uh, way of being able to work with our sensations because you're in contact, you know, it's sensory. It's done with movement of your fingers, your hands, your arms, and it changes the energy in the body. There's movement and that can either be upregulating or downregulating for our nervous system. So we're able to create whatever it is that we need to um, that needs to be worked through and we can either do this through drawings or through working in clay, work at the clay field. Quite profound amazing work. If you haven't experienced it um, I would recommend that you look them up. Um, Cornelia Elbrecht is based in Apollo Bay and Liz is based in Mullaney in uh, Queensland um, and I run some of this training um, as well or some of the experiences of uh, uh, especially the guided drawing, the work at the clay field, that you know, more advanced training in it in itself. It uses, it's very tactile, um, it's the sense of smell, you know, and for every square inch of receptors on our skin, it's, you know, there's 16,000 receptors in that tiny little space that are mapped to all different parts of the cortex. So it's really helpful for, for reprocessing at a sensory level. The more relational work that I do is that's distal, and it uses the senses of sight and motor impulse um, for movement um, but in a much larger way you know in the space of a whole room rather than kind of um, with a piece of paper or a box of clay in, in front of you. My love is to have fluidity and creativity with being able to integrate all of these approaches so that I can go from art experience where the person might have chosen um, a three animals and have built their habitats and created some narrative or story about how each of them they realize that this is the you know, three aspects of their personality that are in conflict with each other or that are working with each other is how I can take that experience and then include that in a piece of work um, with a group of people in a constellation so it would be can you choose three people to, to represent these different parts of yourself and let's set them up and see what the movement is and what your intention is. Yeah, and also the same that I might be doing a piece of constellation work and if somebody is particularly touched by that piece of work and they say I'm noticing something in my body that my heart feels really frozen or stuck or that it has a big cage around it, um, yeah, the, the, I might allow them to follow that movement if we bring their awareness to that part of their body and they make the shape of their heart with their hand and put it right there on their heart and they start making this kind of shaking movement with their fist. Yeah, then what would it be like for them to exaggerate that movement, to follow that movement? Yeah, and then maybe to do it with both hands and then to be able to stand up. And then um, for everybody in the group to be able to stand up and to be able to do this together. And it flows from a piece of constellation work into um, some five rhythms, yeah, where we move into like a staccato rhythm where everybody's um, finding their intention and we move into some chaos where they're able to release or to shake off whatever it is that has stopped this person from being able to feel their softness of their heart or to be able to connect or to be seen 
and yeah, and they're able to process it, you know, moving from one piece of work to another piece of work. That's my passion at the moment. In the talk I gave, I got people to imagine that they had two crayons in each hand and that they were sitting at a table and that if they just made this movement from their belly button to reach out in front of them as far as they could reach with their arms in front of them and then to come back towards their belly and out across in front of them again as far as they could reach and to go backwards and forwards with these two crayons in the center with both hands touching moving backwards and forwards what this feels like in your body when you do that what you notice is that you start to rock on your pelvis and you notice that you start to become a bit more erect in your spine and for a person that's quite depressed you know all of a sudden they're starting to experience that their flow of energy in their body is quite different from being slumped over with their shoulders quite down and they're rounded forward what happens with guided drawing is that clients can have you know 20 pieces of paper on top of each other taped down and it, and one side is touching the belly and the other side they can kind of fully reach reach across it is that they can just close their eyes and to tune into their body sensation and to make whatever movement it is that comes through their hands onto the page and they might do five drawings they might do 20 drawings when they're done with one they'll kind of say yep i'm done and it, that page gets stripped off and they start moving on to the next page. When we lay out these kind of, you know, 10 or 20 drawings in a series and they name them all, they get to see that there's been a quite an emotional journey and a sensory journey that they've been on. What they start to notice is that there's all these different shapes and movements. In guided drawing, Cornelia Elbrecht, uh, in her book on guided drawing and the transformation journey, um, links each of these different shapes that you can make on the page with different stages of the transformation journey. So this movement up and down is kind of like finding your spine. And even if you move the, the crayons across the bottom of the page, it's kind of like connecting with your pelvis or being grounded. For someone who's depressed, this who's maybe stuck in like a big circle who keeps repeating the same pattern day in, day out, um, you want them to maybe just set their, find their intention or their direction and to notice what that feels like in their body when they make this shape. And even people that are suicidal or self-harming, they might actually bring the crayons right back into their belly like they're kind of stubbing themselves like a self-harming kind of movement. And so it's important that we redirect that energy outwards, that they actually make this movement up and outwards off the page with their crayons. So again, this is just another way of being able to work with sensation and for building clients' capacities for being able to regulate their emotion. If we go back to that last one, for someone that's depressed, this is upregulating, yeah? So if arousal is too low, we want to be able to increase their arousal so they get into that zone of proximal development. So for the next one, I want you to imagine that you have two crayons in your hand and that you put them together up on the very left top of the page, stretched out in front of you, yeah? And you come all the way down, close to your belly, and that you then go up to the other side of the page, up to the top right hand side of the page, and then back down again towards your belly and back up again. Yeah, like a big U shape or a big bowl shape. And just to make that movement, yeah, you can even imagine yourself doing this. Two crayons with both your hands together, starting at one corner of the page and going up and down to the other side of the page. If you keep repeating this, just tune in and see what this movement is like for you. Yeah, what does it feel like? Even if you close your eyes and you tune into that sensation, what do you notice? So what some of you noticed and reported is that it feels like you're being rocked yeah, or being cradled. This can be quite a soothing experience. So everyone will experience these movements in different ways. So it's good to check out with clients you know, what their experience is. But again, this is for somebody who has maybe too much chaos in their life or their arousal is too high being able to downregulate their nervous system. And if they're not doing this kind of U shape, then maybe they'll do like a figure eight on its side, like an infinity symbol shape, to be able to experience that rocking. And what needs they couldn't get met themselves in their early life, they can now experience it and take that in and receive it. And this is another shape. So there's 12 of these different shapes. I'm not gonna take you through all of them, but I just thought I'd show you a snapshot of maybe three. So this one, imagine that you have a crown in each hand here at your belly, down at the bottom of the page, and that you go up 
and then straight out separating your hands. Yeah, the left hand goes left, the right hand goes right. And if you keep repeating that up and out, up and out from the base, up and out, yeah, what does that feel like for you? So even just to give yourself a minute to repeat that, that movement up and out at 90 degree angles. This shape is called sorting the seeds. Yeah, what's me, what isn't me, what I want to keep, what I don't want to keep in my life. Again, it's one of the stages of these 12 stages of a transformation journey. This is a transformation symbol. So often you'll see this healing symbol. Yeah, it's like kind of like a sun with radiating rays coming outwards. You'll see this in a person's series of drawings always somewhere. Hopefully they get to that. So this is work at the clay field. Again, this is a sensory approach for being able to work with trauma. Hans Doisner from Germany is the pioneer in this area. It's a box of clay with about 15 kilos in it. The client can have access to a bowl of warm water beside them. And with adults, they do this with the eyes closed. But here, again, is being able to tune in to whatever the sensation is in the body and whatever the impulses are in the hands to be able to move. And in here, the whole, this person's whole world can be created, can be destroyed, can be rebuilt, recreated. And uh, there's that innate capacity within each human to be able to heal themselves if we give them the space. So any trauma that needs to be worked through, you know, for people that have been sexually abused, they might empty out all of the clay and scrub it clean so it's exactly how they want it to be. For other people that have experienced disgust or shame, they may pick some of the clay out and throw it into a bin and get rid of it or may get pushed out of the box of clay and it becomes neutralized and it can be added back in and reworked with. So again, you know, this boy here, this is a boy who has been living on the streets from a toddler and and was finally picked up by child safety when he was about 10. I've been seeing him over the last year. So he's never actually slept at night in a bed. He's always been roaming the streets. He's been smoking cigarettes and pot for several years and had to quit both of these when he was nine years of age, when he went into a, a kinship arrangement. And here he makes underground car park that has really high walls on the sides where it's really safe and very secure. Yeah? And then he makes it really smooth and he slides his hand backwards and forwards and he goes, I can make it as smooth as I want here and nobody can get harmed. And then he says, there's enough space in here that I can include all my family. Yeah, his brothers and sisters that have all moved out of home with their boyfriends or are on drugs, yeah, that he can keep a connection with them here and have a space where they can all fit in and belong and be safe. So, I mean, this is the story, the narrative that he tells me while he's making this in the clay. Um, it's not important that he, that he voices it. I mean, he can if he wants to. Um, some kids will just make stuff and it will be a swimming pool or it'll be a car track or it'll be it. You know, but um, this boy in particular um, was quite psychologically minded and uh, really just blew me away with often the statements that kids come out with. They can experience really high arousal here. I've had another boy who was sexually abused as an infant. Yeah, he was able to throw lots of clay out and he became really excited and he said, this is like the best day of my life ever. You know, I must have said it about 20 times. So he's never had the experience of being able to, to have high arousal in a positive way. It's usually the police come and take him to the emergency department where he's neuroleptized when he's wanting to run away or stab his mother who's pregnant or have sex with a dog or whatever. So to experience high arousal in a positive way was really transforming for him. So we moved now to the third block. Yeah, the third kind of part of the model that of the outside, which is having a systemic lens. This is just an image from um, Monica McGoldrick and Betty McCarter, the expanded life cycle. But they look at the flow of stress through the family system. These are the things that we need to find a way to be able to work with. The client embodies all of these when they come and see you and it's been passed to them through the generations and so we're not just working with the symptoms in the here and now but we're kind of working with what has been passed to them. So we need to have some way of being able to do that. 
And even though I've done family therapy training 15 years ago, probably um, family and systemic constellation work is the, the only way that I found to be able to get to the origins of the trauma and to be able to go back in time to the point where there was you know, the Holocaust or where there was a death or where there was an illness or where there was a, a separation and to be able to work with the ancestors to be able to restore the flow of love and to go back to see who we can find who can be responsible for what has happened in the past. I'll show you a little bit about systemic constellation work. So anyway, it's just good to have a systemic lens. This is another model that I put together a few years ago that I presented at another, another conference. But again, it's just when we look systemically, it's not just between people and relationships, it's also within ourselves as an organism, what is happening systemically, you know, between our neurons and our memory system. And then how that gets played out in school systems, the other systems that we have in our society about if we don't look at systemically how trauma is reinforced, then it's always going to be maintained and be kept alive. So we can start up here. I'll just quickly explain this. But we experience sensation, yeah, whether it's internal or external through our senses. We have to find some way to process that so that information comes in through our stimulus filter, our internal working models. If it's triggering, then we re-experience, there's a spike in our arousal, and we re-experience the past and the present. Yeah, so if there's the reminder of another time that it was unsafe, you know, there's some stimuli that is linked to that, or if there's unmet needs or unprocessed emotion, humans we just have this innate drive for replaying things over and over until they get made sense of or they get worked through or released so that leads to arousal when we have arousal the amygdala fires it hijacks the neocortex yeah we're back down in our brain brainstem yeah in fight or flight or maybe freeze and if we don't have someone who's a secure base to co-regulate with us then this neurological cascade unfolds where the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis is fired we move into our sympathetic arousal in the brainstem, the locus coeliuses is activated. It's the brain's panic button that sends a message down to our adrenals to release more adrenaline. You know, this is a term that children have explained to me in classrooms. They say, yeah, it's kind of like there's a cyclone on the inside, but nobody else can kind of see it. But again, if, if you don't have an attuned caregiver or teacher, it gets missed. Yeah, and then you start to see a behavioral dysregulation. There's the unmet need or the reminder of an unmet need or unprocessed emotional trauma, and then the child becomes behaviorally dysregulated. Yeah, and they say, oh, this is when the cyclone's on the outside. And then they have to have some way of being able to hold themselves together. Quite often there's very primitive defenses. Yeah, they might use projection where they're acting out and they want to get rid of those frightening feelings by putting them into other people. You know, the teachers or other students feel a bit terrorized or terrified. They might split. Uh, you're splitting because they didn't get enough of the good mother or good father. And so in an object relations way, they see the world in fairly black or white terms that you're either a rescuer, you share my mind with me, or you're a persecutor. Yeah, I can't trust you. And they might use omnipotence as another defense. You know, there's about 25 of these defenses or more. You know, they range from denial to reaction formation to you know, intellectualizing, to isolating your affect, to help seeking complaining. There's a whole heap of defenses that people use in the absence of being able to cue directly to get their needs met from a secure attachment figure. The ones that we often see is with kids that are, are labeled with ADHD or autism or um, oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, is that they're, they're really controlling or they're domineering or bossy. This is their defense, omnipotence. Yeah, I don't want to be vulnerable, so I act in powerful ways. Or I'm feeling emotionally out of control on the inside, so who or what can I control in my external world? And if these defenses and the communication from the child aren't made sense of, then what happens is that they get projected into the system. They get projected into foster carers, into parents, into teachers, into therapists. And if they're not made sense of and understood, then what happens is that there's some counter-transference. And when this happens, there's a breakdown in the therapeutic system. People have different views because some feel like they get the child, some feel like they um, are the ones that are being punished or aren't as good as somebody else in the system that gets the child. And when this happens, then the child falls through the gaps. And school systems, I mean, every system we can look at, the colonized approaches, you know, reinforce this trauma because then the child might get isolated, get put in the timeout room. 
they get suspended, which kind of leads to more alienation from their peers, more neglect, treated with indifference, and it reinforces, you know, their early experiences being parented where there's attachment trauma. So we don't realize then that we're reinforcing the trauma, yeah, and what's needed is actually some way of being able to make sense and meaning of it, because if we don't do that, then what happens is that we reinforce, reinforce and consolidate the child's self-concept. These neurons that fire together wire together, we keep their brain hypervigilant and upregulated in a trauma state. Their emotional states become traits. They kind of become uh, either a loner or they become somebody who's really angry or having to find other ways to be able to regulate their emotions that are seen as maladaptive or problematic or they have pathology. Yeah, and this experience gets laid down in their procedural memories, so it even becomes even more automatic for them. So what we need is a way out, is that we can either use mindfulness, and then the child can learn to regulate them, them their emotional state, or we need to be able to use attachment skills here, co-regulation, and if we, either one of these ways, whether it's co-regulation with attachment skills or mindfulness, we then need to add some enrichment activities. So Bruce Perry's work here, I haven't included this slide, but I have a nice table that shows the different sorts of activities for the different areas of the brain that need to, to be enriched. So if it's brainstem early trauma in utero and in the first nine months of life, yeah, there are things like gardening, like playing with water, trampolining, um, being cradled or rocked, uh, drumming, therapeutic use of animals, you know, all those sorts of things. And then we move up to the, the limbic system. Yeah, we can see that drawing and clay and theatre and dance and movement, all those things are really helpful for the limbic system. This is a map of family and systemic constellation work. So this is a new map that I've just put together over the last year in working with groups of, of people that have had trauma and it's a mix of people, they're either clients or they're other therapists or people that I supervise. But basically, we start over here. So this is the client. The client comes to me and they come with their biography, yeah, their known story and their lived experience. And I'm not so interested in this whole big story anymore. You know, I can spend a whole hour hearing about somebody's trauma and then there's nothing that's that's been done that's terribly therapeutic apart from maybe they've been heard or seen or listened to. I mean, that's okay, but there hasn't been much reprocessing. And so what I want to work with is their procedural, their procedural memory, yeah, and the development of their ego defenses. So often people know that ways they hold themselves together have been really adaptive in the past, but now they realize that there's been some costs if they continue to use these strategies. It takes them here to this kind of turning point. Yeah, they often have some kind of symptoms or they go, I can't go on anymore like this. And there's something that's really figural for them, you know, that's kind of standing out. It's an issue. What this is linked to here is trauma that has been passed down or has been experienced. So this is the symptoms and distress and suffering that a person experiences that brings them here to the constellation. Yeah, they have their biography, that's what kind of brings them here, but they want to cross this threshold from what's known to them, and they want something that's new, and, and it takes them up here into the emergent future, a new way of being in the world. And so at the same time, the client comes, I'm always curious more, rather than the trauma story, I'm really curious more about what is their intention that there is this deeper knowing, yeah, whether it's from their spirit or in their bones, or somehow they have a sense of what, what would be different, what would be better, what would be a good outcome for them. So this is what I'm really more interested in, yeah, because this is what I need to be able to facilitate so they can experience healing and transformation. This process is done in a group. For those of you who don't know about constellation work, it can be done in a group of adults in a child and youth mental health service that I work in part-time. I run it with teenagers uh, on a weekly basis and um, it's a group group process. If you don't have a group of people to work with, you can do it with symbols or miniature animals and I can show you a picture of that as well. But basically what happens is that when the client comes with this, these symptoms or these issues, and also their knowingness about what they want to be different, we want to be able to steer our way around this trauma vortex. The symptoms and the distress and suffering in this way is kind of seen as the gateway, yeah? Because 
when the person looks at healing this for themselves, they're also healing it for their family system. So it's kind of like a time portal opens up here. And it's like we can go back in the generations. We can go back to the father, the grandfather, or the grandmother, as far back as we need to in the family system, to the war, or to the country, to the illness, to whatever it was, to be able to heal this trauma. And in order to do that, there's a few things that are needed. We need, in the constellation process, there is this thing called the knowing field. And you need a facilitator who can be really present, that it can allow themselves to be able to get out of the way so that they can tune into their own inner images, um, their own sensations, so that they can notice the phenomenology of what's changing in people's faces, in people's bodies, how they are in relation to each other. And you have the orders of love. Yeah, this is Bert Hellinger's work that I mentioned earlier. The orders of love, and you need to have the capacity of the client working with you. So if the client is in a trauma state or in a child state, they're not able to take in the new information. So it's about how you can ground them, um, how you can connect with the adult part of themselves that can take in the new, the new experience and the felt sense that is healing. The movements, if we look at the specific factors in the constellation, we allow the clients to set up how they are in relation to each other. So it could be that this client here chooses someone to represent themselves, someone to represent their partner or their child or their parents. They may choose someone to represent parts of themselves, like their child self, their adolescent self, their adult self, and that they ask someone in the group to represent these parts of themselves and that they then physically set them up how they are in relation to each other. And when we do that, we start to see that the linkages or lack of linkage between the parts and we start to see where there's lack of differentiation, where there's entanglements. That we allow the clients to be able to follow their own motor impulse for healing in the representatives towards healing. We have to ensure that the, the client and the representatives are grounded, that they're connected to resources, whether it's somatic resources, relational resources, and that they can tune into their guides and their resources, you know, whether it's their you know their higher self or whether it's a big horse that they bring that is represented or whether it's you know someone from their childhood or whether it's one of their ancestors that there is witnessing by whoever needs to witness the work yeah through the representatives and there's also witnessing by the other members of the group that are around the outside circle that are providing the container for the work and um, holding the field yeah and there's co-regulation that's done with the facilitator yeah so that's my job and then at some point there will be a crossing of this threshold here where there is a need for a ritual. So the ritual can involve letting go of what no longer um, serves the client, what they've been holding on to out of the loyalty to, to their family system. And often this is entangled with the trauma. So there can be some ritual about handing that back to who can take care of it, who can be responsible for it. And it can also be a ritual with reclaiming what has been lost through trauma, what is needed to feel whole. There's, with these movements, these motor impulse movements that come through the representatives, there's often healing sentences that get added. And when this work takes place, there's some kind of cellular recalibration that is happening in the client. Yeah, it's like they're being, the parts of themselves are being rebuilt and put back together again. So it leaves them with this kind of new picture of how to be in the world, connected to their resources, connected with their life, connected to the flow of love through their ancestors, to them, to their child, to their work. My job as the facilitator is to anchor these new images and this new arrangement between the representatives into the client's memory. So the client is brought into the constellation so they can receive this imaged memory of it in their mind they can anchor the felt sense of it in their bodies of what it feels like to actually be having this fulfilled gestalt up here it's the optimal gestalt which they already had a deep sense of knowing already when they came to see me when i asked them about what is their intention in this place there's an honoring of the family of the self of your soul and your fate the person is able to reach a place of appreciation yeah, so often uh, what's happened previously is that they might have been really angry 
or they might have been really fixated on uh, that somebody has to pay, that somebody has to take responsibility, and they do this in a really angry way. And it's kind of like the laws of science and physics come into, come into the mix here, because really the communication needs to be done respectfully, yeah, in a way that is dif differentiated, where there's emotional maturity. So they get to experience this if they haven't experienced that before. Because otherwise, if it's you know unleashed with anger, then it's kind of like you know every action has an opposite and equal reaction. You know if we look at the the laws of um, thermodynamics. So what we want here is that the client actually finds some place of appreciation. Yeah, where they can appreciate why people did things in a way that held them together. So there was enough love that this person could be given, even at a very basic level, life to be able to live and to be here now. And when we do that, grace is restored to the family system and the person gets to experience a sense of satisfaction in their life and even joy. And sometimes it's good to even to see what is the movement. You know, if you were to make a movement to express your joy or your satisfaction, what would that be like if you can tune into that in your body? You know, and that could even lead into you know, a piece of um, Five Rhythms work. So this is how Constellation kind of in a nutshell works. And the movement here is from down here from the primary gestalt to the optimal gestalt. So there's a movement away from entanglement, yeah, kind of being trapped here in this trauma vortex that is interrupted reaching out. And there's the movement up to here of having the flow of love restored to the family and order restored to the family system. There's a move from being down here, of being quite unconscious of all of these dynamics that get played out here, and being in autopilot, or either stuck in rigidity or chaos, and in your implicit memory, to being able to move up here, to being in a, a place where you can choose, yeah, where you're really conscious, where your response, you have response flexibility, yeah, where there's some fluidity, you can actually go, how is it that I want this to be in my life? Yeah, so the person can experience a middle ground. And they've had a felt experience of that here already. Yeah, and um, it's been made explicit to them. So it's in their explicit memory. They can see all the steps that were needed to take place in order to be able to reach that. And there's a movement here away from being in fragmentation or com you know, compartmentalization up to here of being of wholeness and integration. Yeah, but there's adaptive linkages now that are quite healthy yeah, between the parts of the system yeah, where people are able to connect but still have boundaries. There's a movement out of isolation to moving into community. The experience of the constellation because it's done in the group is like you are in a community that supports you, yeah, that witnesses um, your vulnerability and you go from kind of being hidden or in your shame up here to being seen and to, with, to be able to withstand, um, yeah, that it's okay to be able to show those aspects of yourself that they can even be honored, yep. And then there's a move also from down here of contraction, you know, we, we see this with people that, um, you know, are depressed, you know, where their body posture is slumped and their shoulders are rounded and forward or they're looking down at the ground. This is the movement of contraction in the body, yeah, to the pull towards death, towards the ground that we see that's the opposite. It's a move towards expansion, towards the light. Yeah, where they're able to lift their head up, to be able to look at life that's ahead of them, in front of them, waiting for them. And they move from being in this protected heart down here, after having wholeheartedness, from being stuck in their frustration and in survival mode, to moving into creativity and into new life. Because down here they were kind of stuck in a limited version of life. And here there's the expansion of moving towards greater life. So this is kind of the cruciform pattern. Yeah, life, death, greater life. We can see it when there's a bushfire. We can see it when a snake sheds its skin. You can see it in a butterfly changing form. Um, in all aspects of nature and the elements, this is normative development. Yeah, you can see it in a, 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 a newborn baby and a toddler that they, life is organized in a particular way and then for it to become reorganized and more differentiated at a more complex level there needs to go through some period of disorganization. So a child that might be sleeping through the night 
then in order to be able to chew its own food doesn't sleep at night and the whole house gets tipped upside down yeah but it's an, so it can actually grow something dies off a stage of development so there can be new life and often clients get this confused with suicide yeah that they think that I need to die it's time for the next life when in fact it's a part of them does need to die off in order to make room for new life yeah even if you've renovated a house you can see that pattern yeah that things are organized in a particular way and then if you want the house to be able to grow and uh, work more functionally yeah you go through a period of disorganization or where something has to die off things get ripped out you know new kitchens and new bathrooms in order for there to be room for new life for greater life yeah to accommodate the whole family with its new stage of development so that's in a nutshell how constellation works so here you have a picture of a constellation this is the end healing picture where you have a client with their child in front of them with all their support behind them so someone might be representing their horse from when they were a child some person might be representing a wild woman from the hills in Scotland. You have their grandmother behind them. You have all of Ireland behind them, or Scotland, whoever the country is, all the women from that country, to be able to feel the flow of love through them to the child. Yeah, and this gets anchored into all of the different memory systems. Yeah, imaged memory. So if you could take a picture of this on this day and date, this is the new picture that I have of me. Yeah feeling regulated, feeling strong, feeling grounded, feeling connected, uh, yep, and noticing where I feel that in my body, so there's the somatic memory of it, very important. Yeah, you can do it with symbols, similar to how you would do a sand tray, except it's using the orders of love and a constellation process. What this takes us to is the fourth block of the building block of theories, yeah, spirituality, the one that was down the bottom. Here, trauma gets transformed and made sense of in a much larger context, you know, the invitation to greater life that we just talked about. You know, I'm always curious about, you know, in this person going on this journey, what is it that they want to do with this experience, yeah, from what they've learnt, yeah, and who else or what else does it put them in touch with, who does it connect them with? So they start to follow this resonance in their life that um, previously it's been seen as pathology, now it's kind of seen as transformation and they're much more integrated and whole and they start to, to ask these bigger questions that they couldn't think about before, yeah, to do with their spirit, why am I here? One of the ways that I can help them to be able to do this is by looking at this model, the hero's journey, which is Sir Joseph Campbell's work. So I'm always tracking this process in a constellation also. But often when we encounter our clients, they're kind of here in their everyday life and they're not very connected to their bodies or to other people. And it's like they're in this wasteland of frustration or despair. It doesn't feel like there's much color, there's lots of tension. And somehow there's this call. They have in them this sense in their gut, in their being, in their mind, that things need to be different. Yeah, And I have some inkling of that. And so this is what I really try to tune into with what their intention is in a constellation. When they start to do that, yeah, and they come for a piece of work, they're here because they want to be able to cross a threshold. So often if people ignore this threshold from their known world into the unknown world, into this new terrain or this new territory or new way of being in the world, they can stagnate here. Yeah, and this is often when people's anxiety or depression gets worse, they can become more suicidal, they can have repeated crises, there's more fearfulness, and their compulsions can kind of take over. Yeah, whether, whether it's with sex or gambling or OCD, you know, eating, yeah, that there starts to be more pathology in other areas of their life. Yeah, and there's a lot more resistance. But they also kind of know that they need to know more somehow. They have this hunger for something else. So if they follow the call and cross this threshold, they come and do the work. When they do that, all of a sudden, strangely enough, resources appear that they can connect with. Yeah, uh, this can be quite uneasy for people. Yeah, you can see from Dan Siegel that when he allows people to become mindful and to follow that wheel of awareness, that they can be overloaded with intrusive memories and thoughts and affect. Yeah, so it can be uneasy. Yeah, but it takes them into this place down here where there's some trials and tribulations. And this is really where transformation starts to happen. Yeah, this is where we kind of face our fears 
and we start to internalize a sense and get better at feeling safe and learning starts to take place. Yeah, And then we're finally able to embark on some kind of ritual where we're able to let go of stuff and to reclaim what is needed and then we start to get back in touch with who we truly are. Yeah, And it's kind of like this rebirth, Yeah, the birth, death, greater life. Yeah, that there's something dies off in order to make way for something bigger. So it's like an awakening happens. And then the person starts to integrate the parts of themselves that have previously been kind of fragmented off. They're able to step more into having a sense of agency in their life, to be have a bit more leadership. It feels like life is finally worth living. Yeah, yeah. And there's this elixir. So throughout this journey of living with trauma or being affected by trauma that somehow in the transformation that I have this new knowledge and experience that can help others yeah and so this starts to tap those questions of spirituality around um, who is this putting me in contact with um, what does it have to do with why I'm here and somehow it links to their work or their, their life or their relationships with who else they can help, you know, connects them with their humanity and their, their community. This is just a helpful model I use in constellation work and also for helping people to be able to look at um, those bigger kind of spiritual issues. So I'm going to leave you with this last slide and it's how did the rose ever open its heart and give to the world all of its beauty? It felt the tender encouragement of light against its being, otherwise we all remain too frightened. Thank you Kent Hoffman for letting me borrow this slide. But this is the work that we do. Clients are in the dark. I think John Balin best described this at this conference, him and Dan Hughes when they were first talking, is that John said that my job as a therapist is to be able to shine the light. The client comes with their darkness and they you know, they might, it might be a child that comes and shows you all these scary games that they play or scary movies or clips that they watch. Our job is to accompany our clients to explore these darker aspects of themselves, the places where the light would otherwise not reach, so they can be resourced enough to face their pain and we can help them to honour their defences, to see how these defences save them when nobody else could, so that they can now turn to the light, reclaim the lost resources, let go of what no longer serves them. They can finally honour themselves and what has been. And in this movement of expansion, they can take in the bigger context of their life. And with this illuminated, things start to make sense and meaning for them, and they can step into even greater life and light. So I guess that makes us all light workers, yeah, providing the conditions for growth for trauma's transformation. So that's the transformative model of therapeutic change. You kind of have to join the dots a little bit. So I hope you got something useful out of that. Uh, if there's anything that's not clear, or if you'd like to receive some experiential training in this model instead of me just talking about it and workshops on this all the time and I also provide supervision in this model. You can reach me by either email, phone or my website. It was great to connect with you. Uh, that's Matt Dilgey signing off. Take care and bye for now.